Hey everybody, in this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about what if a near-death experience was just a con job. That's right, we're talking about Enterprise, episode 18 of season 2, The Crossing. And of course, here on Trek in Time, we talk about every episode of Star Trek in chronological order and in history. So we're looking at things going back to the very beginning of the Trek timeline. So we're in Enterprise, which also means we're in 2003. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a published author. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. With me is my brother, Matt. And Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So we like to think we've got the left brain, right th- brain thing going on. Yeah, We've got the storytelling. We've got the tech. And we're ready to trek. That that, not that's, mean, what, that's a great rhyme. <laughs> I did not mean to rhyme, but I hope everybody enjoyed that. And I hope everybody put a fist in the air and said they are too. So let's get to it. <laughs> Matt, how are you doing? I'm good. How about you? I'm not too bad. As we get ready to discuss The Crossing, I found myself thinking, well, what are we going to talk about? Because big <laughs> picture, spoiler alert, didn't feel like a lot happened in this episode. How did you feel about this one? This might be a very short episode of Truck in Time today because I finished the episode and was like, well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so before we get into the episode and talk about the newest episode, The Crossing, we always like to share some thoughts from previous episodes. So Matt, do you want to jump into comments from our previous episodes? Sure. I have a few comments from the Kenamar episode which was our last one, which we made the joke of it being like Con Air. Mm-hmm. A comment from Mako said, you know, Connemar can also be pronounced Con Air. Mm-hmm. Jokes aside, I like this episode. Nothing too special, but had some interesting ideas. And I think that is right along the lines of how you and I felt at the end of the episode too. It's kind of a, hmm, wasn't bad. Yeah. It was kind of, eh. <laughs> so just- yeah, and one of the things that I think that we discussed in that episode and it, and it continues to lurk in the back of my head is enterprise. We talked in the first season, especially about how much it felt like sitting around a campfire telling, yeah, telling ghost stories. stories. And the idea that this was a frontier, this really was supposed to be humanity stepping out for the first time. And the Canamar episode ends on a note of humans saying point blank to the representative of another world's government. You guys think you're doing things for good reasons, but you're really doing a piss poor job of it. The idea that they would be crossing paths with other societies that are not quite out of the dark ages the way they'd like to think they are mm-hmm. is an aspect of this series that i don't think has been exploited very well up to this point it has not and and that's that's as i was watching this originally back in 2003 i remember thinking like they're they're depicting it almost like they've stepped off of earth and into the future that feels like they're trying too hard to make it so close to the original series yes of humanity's got its worst days behind it as opposed to really kind of embracing the are we really ready for this? Is anybody really ready for this? And we meet other species that are also not quite ready for this and really kind of figuring out, well, you wander into somebody else's space and then you get scooped up by their police as a smuggler. It's kind of analogous to, well, if you leave your home country and visit another country, you are subject to their laws. And those laws may not be fair or objectively humanitarian. Right. But you really don't get to pick that. So this episode, I agree with Mako's response, touches us on, on some interesting ideas. I just wish they had been more exploited in the episode and in the whole of the show. Well, related directly to that, another comment was from AJ Chan that said they could have linked this episode with Judgment, which is an episode two episodes later, which we'll be talking about very soon. Yes. Uh, both talk about the criminal justice system with one being focused on the law side, the judgment, and the other being on the order side, Connemar. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I thought I, th- I liked his call out of foreshadowing of what you and I are going to be talking about probably in the next episode. Yeah. And then finally, the last one, which was just a fun one from Robotrav. I really like the camera work in this episode. <laughs> it really had the right feel throughout. I agree. Like for yeah. me, the film ma- filmmaking aspect of the Connemar episode was really good. It was well done. It was yeah. the writing that felt not quite fully baked. 
Yeah, I think we're in good days as far as directors for yes. this stretch of episodes. We're seeing the same names again and again, and we're going to see that again today with uh, David Livingston as the director of today's episode. And we've seen him in other episodes more recently this season, season two. He directed Stigma and he directed Precious Cargo. And both of those episodes were ones that we responded to with some uneven responses, especially Precious Cargo, where we were like, oh, there were some missed opportunities within the story. But neither of us had any issues with the directing. In fact, especially with Precious Cargo, my response to Precious Cargo was I thought it was very well directed. I yeah. thought it did a very good job of doing a lot with some very interesting takes on making alien worlds look very unique and i i think that we're going to see that again in today's episode as well so today's episode matt do you hear that read alert <laughs> that can only mean one thing <laughs> you've Here we got go. to read the wikipedia description matt okay the crossing is the 44th episode of the television series star trek enterprise the 18th of the second season incorporeal beings attempt to take over the earth starship enterprise at the start of the episode enterprise is taken inside an enormous alien spacecraft of unknown origin and the aliens take over various crew members bodies later in the episode the crew takes shelter in the catwalk <laughs> in the catwalk which has enhanced shielding oh and the episode no, is directed by alan that, no that's 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 actually <laughs> that's not accurate that's that's an old note from a different episode okay. so we'll just delete that delete from the that notes. So the synopsis is basically at the beginning of the episode, incorporeal aliens try to take over the Earth spaceship Enterprise. And later in the episode, the crew takes shelter on the catwalk. Yeah. That's the end of the synopsis. That's the entirety, which to that, me. That's also the episode. Me, yes. <laughs> to me, this synopsis feels like I wrote it when I was in second grade and didn't actually read the entire book and had to write a book report. Yes. It's filler. Yes. So as that synopsis barely says, this is episode 18 of season two. It's directed by David Livingston, as I mentioned before. The story is written by Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, and Andre Bormanis. And the teleplay is by Rick Berman and Brandon Braga. Matt, I don't think I'm going out too far into new territory when I point out that we've said before. Oh, yeah. We aren't the biggest fans of the Rick Berman, Brandon Braga episodes. Two men who On the shaped, <laughs> yes. shaped modern Trek in ways that revived, revived a franchise that was for all intents and purposes in a holding pattern. Yep. And did things to propel it into the future that I will forever appreciate. But in Enterprise, when it came to their episodes where they were heavily steeped in making the story, yeah, it just feels like two tired people really trying to recapture lightning in a bottle. This is one of those episodes. Yeah. The original air date was April 2nd, 2003. So I don't get to make April Fool's jokes. Unfortunately, the calendar just didn't work out for me in that regard. But what was going on on April 2nd, 2003, you ask, Matt? Well... I don't have to remind you, you were listening to All I Have, which is Jennifer Lopez featuring LL Cool J and at movies, at movies, is that even at a movies? <laughs> what going on at movies? <laughs> hey, have you been at movies recently? <laughs> Make sure you get at movies tonight. Oscars caveman, right? Star Trek. <laughs> yes. So at the movies, we were going to see Head of State. Head of State is the 2003 American political comedy directed, written, and starring Chris Rock and co-starring Bernie Mac. It was Chris Rock's directorial debut, and he had previously worked as a writer, producer, and actor. The movie made $13 million. And on television, on this day, April 2nd, 2003, Enterprise earned 3.9 million viewers, which is about average for the season. But how does it stack up against the competition? Well, not too great. No. My wife and kids was getting 8.7. George Lopez was getting 8.6. They were both on ABC. The often talked about but completely forgotten Star Search in primetime on CBS got 9.5 million on Fox. 
that 70s show and American Idol were getting 11 million and 20 million respectively. Mm. And on NBC, Dateline was getting 9.4. But luckily for Enterprise, Matt, the WB did not oh, rerun yeah. the Lone Ranger again, which beat Enterprise the previous week. This week, they went back to Dawson's Creek and Enterprise was just barely able to squeak out more viewers. So that's good news for Enterprise. All was right with the world. That's right. And despite American Idol getting 20 million viewers for the week, the top rated show was CSI. Crime Scene Investigation, again on CBS, getting 26 million viewers for the week. And in the news, well, it's in broadcast time. It's been about six weeks since we've seen an episode. The last time we talked about an episode was an episode that was aired in February. Here we are, April 2nd, 2003. And for those people who may not recall, a little thing called the Iraq War started in the interim. The Iraq War began on March 20th, 2003. And it would officially last until 2011 with the beginning of the drawdown of troops authorized by President Bush in 2008. The total number of troops at its maximum was 170,000, and the initial fighting was swift with Hussein being captured and executed three years later. But the civil war that broke out and allowed for al-Qaeda and insurgency operations for years made the war a protracted effort. So the news up to this point had been as I've shared it in week to week, a variety of different sources and a variety of different coverage of the drumbeat leading up to the war. But at this point, here we are, it's only been a couple of weeks since the war started. The entirety of the New York Times front page was nothing but war coverage, including generals and other military experts calling out critics of the war for being unpatriotic and doing a disservice to the servicemen serving in mm-hmm. the Iraq war. And of course, hindsight being 2020, people looking back at the beginning of the Iraq war, there were opportunities missed to do certain things in a better way, which is what the criticism was about. So right. the coverage in the New York Times, the response to the war in the New York Times, and the overall conversation that was being had publicly was beginning to revolve entirely around you're either a patriot or you're against the country and the servicemen. So that's what was on display mainly on the front page on April 2nd, 2003. And I would want to point out that all of the stuff that we've been talking about over the past months in the news doesn't have a direct relation to what's happening in Star Trek. Yeah. But starting next season. Yeah. It does. What we're, yeah. Yeah. That's a very yeah. good point to mention that the the structure of this podcast is very much to take a look at the era in which the shows emerged and enterprise is an interesting, there's something about enterprise, almost like the show is a ship in a bottle. Yes. And the original series constantly tackled social issues of the late sixties, early seventies in its storytelling. Next generation did something similar. It pulled conversations that were just beginning to percolate in the mid to late 80s. Deep Space Nine, Voyager did that same thing to varying degrees as we entered the end of the century. But Enterprise up to this point has felt very hesitant to dip its toe into what is actually going on. We've only had a couple of episodes where you and I have talked about, oh, this is an analogy for what was going on at that time. We had the episode which revolved around the AIDS metaphor. And we yep. discussed what was going on with the, eight, the fight against AIDS in the United States and the world at large in connection to the program. But we haven't been able to do that too much. But as Matt points out, stay tuned because 10 episodes from now, we're going to start very having very different conversations because at this point, the Iraq war has just begun. The producers and writers of this program have not had an opportunity to digest what is going on and produce shows reflecting the reality of the world that was being lived. That's going to start with season three. Yep. So here we are still in season two, still looking at the crossing. And again, with patent pending Sean Farrell's pick the calendar date game, (laughs) 
The most recent episode with a specific date was an episode dated September 2152. The next one with a specific date will be dated January 2153. We're just a couple of episodes away from that, which means I'm speculating that this is happening sometime in early December 2152. And we start with the ship at warp speed and being pursued by, well, I'm just going to call it a giant manta ray. Yeah. It, it's it's clear as day what it looks like. It's like there's no hiding it. They clearly yeah. took inspiration from sea life for mm-hmm. the way it looks. Yeah. I, I will say the one thing about the opening of this episode, <laughs> it's a really good cold open. Like yeah. the opening of this episode was really tight, really like what the, and then it goes to the title sequence, which I, of course, fast forward as quickly as I can because I can't stand the th- theme song. Yes. But it, it's, it was a really good cold open that, did not deliver after it came back from the style sequences. So usually we're like, that cold open made no sense. And it kind of went nowhere and blah, blah, blah. It's like this one, they got the cold open right. And they kind of didn't deliver on the the, the second half of the show. For me, I've discovered that if I hit my fast forward, my skip button 10 times, the moment I hear the phrase, it's been a long road. It's been a long road. I get Im- <laughs> I get immediately I get immediately to the end of the opening credits and see the title and the the opening of the episode first chapter so yeah. I've got that down to a science me too This episode was frustrating because I kept feeling like it felt a little bit like playing a game where you know the game where it was popularized by Ellen you have your phone you put it on your forehead and it gives the the name of the thing that the person is supposed to guess Mm -hmm. and if they get it right they look back and if they get it wrong they look down and it and it changes the the Uh guess and it'll be like celebrities and you're supposed to say things like oh he was in terminator 2 and it'd be like arnold schwarzenegger and ding you get it right i felt like this episode was giving me a list of really great sci-fi movies (laughs) and i would be like Oh, this episode this. is going to be like Close Encounters. Ding. And then right. the show would suddenly change direction. And it would be, oh, it's not going to be like Close Encounters at all. It's going to be like The Abyss. Like, oh, no, it's not going to be like The Abyss. It's going to be like Starman. Oh, no, it's not going to be like Starman. It's going to be like Cocoon. No, it's not going to be like <laughs> And by the time they get to a point where, oh, this is what the episode is going to be, it settled into the laziest aspect of the enterprise storytelling, which I'm going to cut to the end. This is all about an invasion, an invasion force onto the enterprise. Yes. Yes. They're trying to take over. And I couldn't have been less interested in that aspect of this. Yes. I, I don't disagree with anything you were saying. I agree for me. I wasn't seeing all of the different movies that it was ripping off. It was just, Homer Simpson going boring <laughs> throughout most of the episode. Yeah. I was not interested. And then all the time there were like these moments of like, oh, this is so sci-fi that made me go, no, this is just stupid sci-fi. And I kept asking like, how does that make sense? Like, yeah. Sean, I know you could write this off by just saying, oh, it's so science fiction and so out there. We can't comprehend. Why would a non-corporeal being require a corporeal ship? Yes. Yeah. Why would a non-corporeal b- being not be able to exist in space? They're subspace creatures. What? D- it's like WTF just kept yeah. coming into my head <laughs> every time it was like, it's like, here's this huge ship that takes it over and they're non-corporeal. What? What? How, yeah. what? How do they operate the ship? Like, <laughs> you can't push buttons. You can't do <laughs> it's a physical ship with a non-physical being. Yeah. It makes no sense. So it's like on just the science fiction aspect of this, it just fell apart for me yeah, completely. Yeah. And then I was just bored with what they were doing. Yeah, I completely agree. And for me, I put my notes together into, I have two large categories in my notes for every episode. What worked, what didn't work. Like just kind of like big spitball places for me to put some notes down to remember to talk about what yeah. worked. This episode was nominated for an Emmy Award for visual effects. Yeah, the visual very, effects were great. Very clearly earned. There yeah. are more than a handful of times where we see the alien entities enter and leave it's rooms, really cool. enter people's, you know, they, they, they go into a person's face. They kind of like absorb up into the brain. 
And the way they suck back out. And then then the way they suck back out, they start referring to themselves as wisps based on the, the first time one of them takes over trip and is in conversation then with T'Pol and Archer. And here is the word wisp playfully plays with the word wisp and says, yeah, that's what you can call us. You can refer to us as wisps. It makes sense. And that really is, it's like watching gossamer tissue paper like travel into a person's face and leave their face. And the effect is not, does not look green screeny, does not look laid on in a way that is distracting. It really feels very incorporated into the image. And, and I stopped really seeing it as a special effect at a certain point. It's so well done in the episode. As far as what didn't work, well, Matt, you were just basically saying like, these are not good sci-fi ideas. And Mm -hmm. Rick Berman has been quoted as describing the episode as, quote, heavy science fiction that I'm very pleased with. Oh, boy. No. And that left me really feeling like. No. I wonder, does Mr. Berman actually know what science fiction is, especially in reference to this is what stood out to me. He's quoted as saying this will remind people of the alien clouds from the original series. And he's referring to a specific episode about alien clouds that are able to take over individuals of the enterprise. This episode felt to me like a lesser version of an, of an episode from the original series. It felt like, as you mentioned, you have beings from subspace. They are non-corporeal. Why do they have a ship? Why do they need a ship? None of that is ever explained. If it, if there is a reason for it, please provide it to us because otherwise it doesn't make much sense. There are things I envisioned which could have done things to change the nature of the episode, which could have been something like introduce the idea that there are dimensions that never fully unfurled at the beginning of the Big Bang. We have the known dimensions that we experience. Propose the idea that there's a dimension that doesn't get unfurled, but it existed in enough of a way that these subspace beings are able to exist and that their subspace level, their dimension is decaying. So they have to come into our dimension. They have to enter this universe in order to survive. Then you end up with an opportunity to say like, okay, these are beings that are struggling for survival as opposed to just being jerks. You're you're nailing the, the, the thing I would say. The best science fiction and fantasy, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want, but you have to establish clear rules that make sense within mm-hmm. the confines of the little universe that you're building. You're creating non-corporeal beings. The first question should be, what would their ship be like? What, mm-hmm. How would they travel in space and design something that would make sense for a non-corporeal being? It could have just been like a subspace rift. Mm-hmm. That was chasing the ship and then enveloped them and selling the the enterprise is in some kind of like bubble universe thing that these wisps keep coming in and out of. It's not a physical ship. It's something that would mm-hmm. make sense for a non-corporeal being. They just took the laziest path out. Yeah. And then to kind of harp on how it makes no sense, in one part of the episode, to to show that they're trustworthy, they release the enterprise. So now the enterprise is not inside their ship anymore. It's in front of their ship. Mm-hmm. These wisps keep traveling from the sh- their ship outside in space and then come inside the enterprise. Right. And yet, and yet they say, we can't exist in space. Yes. And <laughs> how the hell are you getting aboard the ship when it's no longer inside yours and you're traveling through space to get in the enterprise? Right. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. They didn't even explain it. It could have been like, we're going in and out of subspace. Like, so right. we can kind of reappear in your ship. It's like, they didn't even say anything. Right. It was just lazy, lazy, lazy. They didn't even bother yeah. a half a sentence explanation for any of this stuff. Yeah. I had any number of explanations pop into my head as to yeah. ways that you could have set up these wisps in a way that would have answered some of these questions. Like I just suggested, what if they are beings from a, a dimension that is effectively decaying? It's an it's a unused tendril of the Big Bang. And so they need to survive. So they're trying to escape. Or what if they are subspace beings? that through some other alien race that built that ship and the alien race that built that ship was conducting experiments and accidentally pulled them out of subspace and now they're trapped and they're trapped here 
And now they have to figure out how do we survive in this place, which is not our universe. And we are dying right. if we don't do something else. There's never a very clear explanation as to why these incorporeal beings would want to become corporeal. Why would they want to lock themselves into this type of experience? I cannot imagine as a human deciding I'm an explorer. Well, I'm going to go to the Galapagos and I'm going to try to change brains with this tortoise because I think that sounds interesting. Well, they did try. They did try to address that because there was the, the, the dinner scene where Trip is just eat, gorging himself on all this food because this being has not eaten. And it doesn't, it's a new experience to him. Right. It came, they tried to explain it as we were just like you a millennia ago and we evolved into this and they evolved into that and it's, they're so separated from it now. It's almost like they're bored and that they're seeking something new. And basically right. what they're trying to basically evolve kind of back again, because, Ooh, flavors and sensations and sex and gender and all that kind right. of stuff. It's all new and exciting. So kind of like they were trying to explain some kind of motivation for why they would want to come back. But for hedonism, that's your explanation is basically hedonism. It's like yeah. they just want to get it on and eat lots of food. It's like, no, that yeah. is that is not a good explanation for why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. I found myself thinking when this went from, OK, it's like close encounters. No, it's like the abyss because then they get sucked into the ship. You see the Enterprise inside their ship, and I thought it had a certain, a certain abyss-like feel to it. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, oh, no, it's going to be the body swapping. It's going to be Trip is going to be, it's going to be like Starman. He's going to be a being who's using Trip's body. And mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think, okay, the interesting turn for this would be for this Trip, who is not Trip, for not Trip, to convince Archer, we don't mean you any harm. We are explorers just like you. We used to be like you, but we haven't experienced anything like this before. We would invite any of your crew that want to experience what Trip is experiencing to do the same thing. We would, we would be happy to do this kind of crossing with all of you, but it's temporary. It doesn't have to last. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can trust us and do the demonstrated swapping back that they do where trip does come back and trip is like mm -hmm. it was remarkable and he explains how he went places and saw things that were visceral and real and they were it's it's tied into memory for him in an interesting way it's tied mm -hmm. into memory while also being outside of the body so it's three dimension it's a sort of four-dimensional experience time and space are both affected by this and wouldn't it have been interesting if they had the initial crossing non trip makes this argument of you can trust us. We are, don't mean any harm. We're explorers just like you. And we want to experience what you, what you experience on the corporeal level, swapping back to demonstrate we actually don't mean any harm. And then swapping again, where non trip comes back and begins to have long conversations with Archer and to Paul and his other shipmates about who this non-trip is. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes time to return, non-trip makes the claim, trip doesn't want to come back. There you go. Now you have the second no and third it. act being yep. about Archer's distrust of an alien entity that is saying trip does not want to return. And it becoming then, okay, how do we force the switch back? How do we make sure that we get our crewmen back? Because we can't actually trust this. What if then your final act involves the Enterprise figuring out a way to force the swap back? They force the crossing to occur again. The non-trip is now replaced with trip. And in doing so, something happens to the aliens. Something is damaged in their ship. Something, it, the non-trip is hurt or killed. And now trip is back. And the Enterprise now just gets away from this strange, damaged ship. And as they're leaving, Trip reveals, I was exploring things that humanity would never get a chance to do. I didn't want to come back. That would have been very emotional. Would resonant. that have <laughs> yes. been an yes. incredible ending, especially since Trip is the character. You've talked about this. You pointed this out many episodes ago. 
Trip is the explorer of the show. This episode has a couple of moments where like as uneven as the idea behind this quote heavy sci-fi show this episode is and I do not think this is heavy sci-fi. I think this is largely just kind of speculative fantasy writing. There are moments of character development in this episode that could have been explored and expanded upon in really interesting ways. One of the things yep. that stands out is to Paul has a moment where she says to Archer, you have said you trust my judgment. Trust me here. Like yep. a really strong moment between her and Archer because she basically says, I think I can figure out what they want because as a Vulcan, I'm more prepared to keep them out. So let me go put myself out in, as bait, get in contact with them and figure out if I can figure out what their goals are. And he doesn't want to have that happen. There is also for Archer, there is a moment where they manage to finally figure out a safe place to hide the ship. And it is suggested to him, shouldn't we just get the hell out of here? And he says, not without our crewmen. We're not leaving anybody behind. For yeah, they him, were going to leave like two dozen people behind. Yeah. Yep. And he is planting a flag in his character in that moment of his primary responsibility as captain is to his crew. For him, that's the primary concern above exploration. But Trip has again and again and again demonstrated, I want to see these things. I want to grow a nipple on my wrist. I want to go. <laughs> I want to go refilm enemy mind with a guy on a desert planet like he's the one who's yep. that character in this series i can only imagine how it would have resonated for his character if he had come back and said captain i didn't want to come back yeah and i don't know it would have left, it would have can, left the episode yeah. in a moral quandary because they just damaged that ship they weren't lying to us yeah oh crap it's like right. it leaves it in kind of a uh, we're f once again the enterprise is kind of fumbling their way through space. Right. It would have fit it would have fit the brand of the show. It would have fit all the characters. I agree with you. I do want to say we're bagging on this episode a lot, but there was an aspect of the show I did enjoy a lot. Flocks. Mm -hmm. This was action flocks and it was so awesome because it was so core to who he is. He's not an action guy. Yeah, And I, there were so many moments where he's like action man because he's the only one that can't be taken over where he's walking the ship and he's they're talking him through doing all this stuff and he's he doesn't know what he's doing. Like the whole thing of him trying to pull open the panel and, and then the, he can't get it open. The captain's like, you got to put some muscle behind it. He almost knocks himself unconscious trying to get the panel open. The, the, all of that stuff I thought was wonderful with him because it was so it was just so pitch perfect and on brand for who Flox is and why. He's one of my favorite characters in the show, and it was nice for him to get some screen time for him to show that he is a capable part of the crew and he's willing to put himself at risk to save everybody. I thought that was nice. So it's like, for me, the one acceptable part of this episode was all about him. Um, and the other scenes that you mentioned, like the dialogue between him and DePaul was really nice. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a nice uh, moment where she's saying, trust me. So there were character moments that were well done i think there were a it lot was, of very good character moments yeah. i think that this episode is not one that i would necessarily suggest people skip over i give it i feel like the series as a whole at this point from me is earning a high c low b average yeah as far as there have been episodes that you and i have both really enjoyed that have hit that a mark but they're very infrequent and the show just feels like it bumps along not just is it an average, but it's also the mean. It's like most of the shows feel like if you just creak, you know, just like crank this knob a little bit harder, you could have taken the same core episode mm -hmm. into stronger territory. And that's where this one lands for me. The, like I said, the initial idea around what could these aliens have done? What could the ending have been like? The, my idea that what if Trip had come back and said, I didn't want to come back. Why did you bring me back? Um, it being just, a metaphor for near death experience that is not really plumbed because, yeah. and, and for me, one of the, the weakest points of this is everybody on the crew. Some of them have literally been in the room watching these aliens enter and leave their crewmates. So there are people in the dining hall who watch as trip is basically turns into another person. 
They mm-hmm. see the entity happen. The captain's responsibility and the bridge crew's responsibility for the rest of the crew, the rest of the crew would be informed about what's going on. The entire crew, there's a one moment where T'Pol says the crew is uneasy, but they're still functioning at high efficiency, despite the fact that the ship has been swallowed by this alien vessel. So this is a crew that is aware of everything that's going on. And yet every single time anybody gets taken over by an alien yes. entity, the yes. people around that individual will be Not like, every time. Bob, why Not are you every acting time. so weird? Not every time. I was impressed the first time that Tri- when Trip gets taken over when he's working on the warp engine and he just leaves and the guy's like, sir, where are you going? And yeah. he's just like walks out. He immediately calls the captain and says, there's something wrong with Trip." Yeah. And I was like, that's awesome. Yeah. But then fast forward halfway into the episode and reads on the elevator with that woman yeah. and just starts going, the stuff he's saying to her, she would have been informed and she'd be immediately yeah. like, okay, yeah. this is not Reed. Yeah. But instead she plays it off like, I'm just getting sexually harassed by a superior officer. Yeah. Great. And yeah. she rolls her eyes and walks away. And she handles it with a rolling of eyes as opposed to like, sir, I'm going to report this. This is like, exactly. This is completely yeah. inappropriate. It's within the confines of the show. Not only is her response does not make sense given the reality of the experience with the alien entities. It doesn't make sense within the realities of what an advanced military operation would look like. And for me, the one that was the most egregious was when Mayweather is sent to find Reed or he's sent to find trip. And when he finds trip and trip immediately begins to be like, I'm fine. And then walks like a robot down the gangplank. He's still going, sir. Mayweather is chasing him down the gangplank yelling, sir, why, why are you acting so weird? And it's like, golly, you, you don't use Mayweather enough. And then when you do use him, you make him act like he's just arrived to the planet. Like he's never met any of these people before. It was little things like that, that just, can we talk about the ending? Absolutely. Um, the, the ending was, I thought, a horrible disappointment. It was yeah. just like, okay, they shoot them and blow them up and just kill every single one of those aliens. Yeah. Because they established in the show they can't exist in space, so they blew up their ship, which means they just killed all of those things. Yeah. And then they just go, see ya, and yeah. just fly away. And there's like no ramifications for it. You just killed hundreds of beings. Right. What? Yeah. Where if you tie back to what you were talking about where they're stranded here and something like that, it's like there would be this uh, moral quandary you end up in the end if they did that of like the have a scene with the captain going i can't believe we just did that but they left us no choice and you right. show, show the struggle that they had with what they ended up having to do yeah none of that it was it was like yeah let's just kill those people and go off to gallivant into space next episode right it's like it, it was so it just inappropriate it felt completely inappropriate to me yeah it and it was it felt like opening up a can of Deus Ex Machina where it was just like, we need to end this episode. So how about we blow up the ship Mm -hmm. as opposed to, like I mentioned before, if you have any kind of ending that revolves around like we misinterpreted and we acted from a place of fear as opposed to leaving open the possibility that an extremely powerful being that we can't, control could actually be benevolent in a way that Mm -hmm. we don't anticipate there could have been that final conversation where it would have been a wrap-up of well in order to get away we did a thing we did a thing that put them in danger but we also left them in a place where they can survive so we didn't do unforgivable harm but we've bruised our relationship with them and now they will not trust us And then the one individual on the crew trip who might be looking at it as I would want to go back is no longer welcome. Yep. That conversation, I would have wanted to see that conversation between trip and Archer of captain. What, what were you thinking? And it being the explorer against the caretaker having that conversation where Archer would be able to say, I understand you're mad at me, but you're Mm -hmm. my crewman and my first responsibility without being in communication with you is to make sure you're safe. Mm -hmm. That ending would have had a much stronger resilience than what we end up with of, we just blew up a bunch of bad guys and they are clearly demonstrated as bad guys, even to the point of, I mean, you mentioned flocks 
he has got some great sequences, including having to go visit Hoshi, who, when she is taken over, fakes an inju- injury. She calls for Flox's attention, claiming that the body that she is in is now injured. So they are lying. They are they are nefarious and they are not to be trusted and without any motive described in any way that makes us care other Mm -hmm. than survival. And we've seen that again and again and again, and it, it doesn't have a new interesting hook. There's nothing here to to hook us. But at the end of the day, I think from a special effects perspective, I think from a, character driven perspective of the nice moments between certain characters. And I also think even from a humor perspective, you can kind of, yes, yes. you can kind of this, there's humor in two forms. There's a little bit of the built in humor around when the people start acting a little weird. And like you mentioned, trip saying, you know, I'm fine. Thank you, sir. To an underling and then disappears down a hatch. That doesn't make any sense. It looks for all the world. Like he's just going into the engine. At that yeah, point, I'm going to do a Jeffrey's tube. Yeah, it's like he goes to a Jeffrey's tube, <laughs> and the response from the crewman is to like, like, things, what? Uh, so there's humor <laughs> yeah. there. There's yeah. also unintentional humor in the form of you can kind of, especially if you're watching this with somebody, I think this would be a fun episode to kind of MST3K it. Like, yeah, if you're willing tracks, to like just little, have yeah. you have some riff tracks moments and like kind of laugh along with the episode and and do a mystery science theater take on it. I think it can be a fun hate watch in that way. So I don't say stay away from this one, but as far as like the big picture for Trek, like Matt hinted at the beginning of this episode, season three, we're going to start seeing things firing on different cylinders that we're not accustomed to. Yep. And that's where the, the show really gets some traction before we sign off. Matt, is there anything else you'd like to remind our listeners about what do you have going on on your other channel? Well, I would say just to check out our other podcast with our wonderful host on that show too, still to be determined. It's a follow-up podcast to my channel on YouTube where we talk about user viewer comments and just kind of feedback and kind of uh, follow-up thoughts on the episodes. Be sure to just check that show out. As for me, you can check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can find out information about my books there. You can also go directly to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or even non-mega bookstores. Believe it or not, smaller bookstores exist and public libraries, and you can find my books at all those locations. Matt, next time we're going to be talking, as Mr. Chan pointed out, we're going to be talking about judgment. Yes. Do you have any predictions about what judgment will be about? Maybe something to do with the justice system? (laughs) Oh, Uh? Mr. Chan, you let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. Curse upon you. (laughs) Spoiler. Don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, please consider leaving a review wherever it is that you found the show. Under your bed. Behind the door. (laughs) In the back of a drawer or on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. There's lots of places you can find this podcast. You know where you found it. Go back there and review us. Thanks so much. If you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show and become a supporter there by clicking the become a supporter button, creatively named, I know. And you can throw some coins at our head. We do appreciate it. And we do have some supporters and we. Thanks to Thank those much. supporters. Thank you so much. You're helping to keep this going and you're helping us improve the show in the form of tight editing with an actual professional editor. So <laughs> yes. thank you so much, everybody, for listening. All of that really does help support the show and we'll talk to you next time.